Um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm also humbled because I see that um, the other persons are um, professors, and I'm just a PhD. I'm academically speaking, I'm non-existent kind of, uh, <laughs> because we, uh, when we, uh, when we applied for the finances, um, we only got money for the for the people with PhD. We don't get money for people without PhD. So I'm one of them. Um, yeah. Um, First, I didn't want to, to give a presentation on this conference because uh, I'm also part of the organizing team and uh, I knew that I would regret uh, to give a presentation because I knew that I couldn't have the time to, uh, to do a proper preparation for it. But then, uh, unfortunately, Matteo Cestari, who, who also wanted to speak here, he couldn't come and um, then there was one place free and people said, uh, come on, do it. Uh, it's so close to your um, PhD thesis, and that's also true. So if I hadn't done it, I would also have regretted it. So, yeah. The topic of my presentation is kata and katachi uh, towards an embodied phenomenology. So first of all, as an introduction, um, I want to start with my current research topic, which is, um, uh, which is about the phenomenology of embodiment and self-cultivation and with a special connection to the, to the Japanese arts or ways of self-cultivation, uh, michi or do. My goal in doing this research is um, to find a, a way or mode of a phenomenology that, uh, that includes embodiment not only as an as a, um, object of study, but as a kind of method, as part of uh, phenom phenomenology itself. So uh, I want to think about um, a way of doing phenomenology that is kind of done in the medium of the body itself, um, so that the descriptions that are done by this kind of phenomenology are not just um, written in, in, in script or in, uh, in language, but um, that we actually have to practice with the body to do this kind of phenomenology. So I'm uh, searching for a possible method methodology uh, for an embodied phenomenology, or also you can also call it phenopraxis, um, which is uh, a term I got from Rolf Elberfeld, who's also thinking about, um, he calls it transformative phenomenology, so I'm kind of in this line. So, um, first of all, um, the Japanese uh, ways of self-cultivation. Um, self-cultivation is a term um, which I take from Robert E. Carter for the, for the English translation. It's a translation of Shukyo. And uh, self-cultivation, um, you could argue about the translation because there is no self in Shukyo in, in Japanese. Uh, there, there is a definition, I, I think I, I didn't take it into the PowerPoint this time, but um, there's a definition in the um, Bukyo Jiten by Nakamura Hajime where um, he includes in the definition uh, um, this kind of self in the, in the sense that, in the Zen Buddhist sense of finding the true self, you, um, you repeatedly embody something. And uh, this is his definition of Shugyo, so it's kind of close to self-cultivation in, in the English language maybe. So um, I made this um, overview to, to give you an uh, insight in what, what, what kind of practices are included in this uh, ways of self-cultivation. So uh, as an as a, um, like, um, overview um, distinction, there, there are artistic ways um, called gedo and um, the martial ways called budo, what we also call martial arts. And uh, in the group of the artistic ways, Gedo, um, there's the way of tea, the way of calligraphy, the way of the flower, the way of scans, the way of poetry also. Uh, interestingly, um, the oldest one uh, which was called uh, a way is the way of poetry, which is not, uh, for me, uh, an embodiment art in the, in the strict sense. And then you also have the performative arts, which are not normally called ways, but, um, for example, in the writings of Zeami, we often find the term Amici, or do, um, as a description of what he is doing. So he himself sees, sees him in this um, line, but um, the, this kind of term isn't used for, for no or um, kabuki, for example. And then the martial arts, uh, we have different kinds of martial arts, the um, 
ones we, uh, where you use a sword or another weapon which are armed, like the way of the sword, or iaido, um, the way of drawing the sword, the way of the bow, and then the unarmed ones, aikido, judo, karate do, which are probably the most famous. I personally um, practice Aikido, so I'm coming from this direction, and I think, Mika, you also do Aikido, so <laughs> it's nice to have a, a kind of group there. So um, many of the um, Budo, the martial arts, were originally called Jutsu, not Do, and Jutsu is something like a technique, or um, it's more technical, and Do um, has much more philosophical uh, soundings to it, so... The, the, the transition from Jutsu to Do is actually something that for most of these ways happened uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, so it's a pretty late development. Uh, in the Edo period, for example, everything, almost all these things were called Jutsu. So there were Aiki Jutsu, Ju Jutsu. Karate is something else. Um, it's very closely connected um, to Okinawa and has a different kind of um, tradition. But uh, Kyujutsu, for example, um, the technique of the bow, yeah. So, um, I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about the uh, etymology of kata. Um, I'm more interested in trying to directly connect it to practice. But today I'm not giving uh, concrete examples, but just try to give an overview of my um, of um, the method I'm trying to, to use to, to get a philosophical um, access to, to these kind of practices. So just, uh, I thought as an introduction, um, I could give a, a bit of um, information about the, the meanings of the signs of the Chinese symbols for kata. Um, but uh, and I think Enrico also said something about this. So um, as you said, uh, kata, the, uh, the one that's mostly used, um, the, the one in, in the first line, is originally a mold made uh, of clay for um, doing copies of a, of a model. And I think um, in, the, in the way Jap uh, it's understood in Japanese, it's act actually sometimes close to this. You, you, um, first of all, you copy, you repeat. And uh, then there's also another kata, which is um, mostly used as a suffix for um, verb forms. Um, for example, kangai kata, a way of thinking, or shikata, a way of doing something. So there's already, um, although it's a different sign, uh, the, the, um, you, you speak it in the same way, so um, there's already a connection to something like a method of doing something. The oldest um, word used in, the, uh, in these performative arts is probably from Zeami, who used the term katagi, which is um, also very close to this is a kind of wooden uh, printing block and he uses this for the basic pattern, patterns of, um, of performance in no theater. So um, no theater and the, the way of the sword are probably the traditional um, sources of, um, the, of the like classical um, terminology of these ways. I'm, I'm not referring to this classical methodology because um, I want to base my approach today not on scriptures, but on practice. So, um, I'm thinking uh, of using kata as, a, as an example um, for a practice which can be connected to phenomenology because the method um, of this embodiment practice itself has some similar um, approaches as we find them in uh, classical phenomenology. So, kata are reduced forms of movement or um, uh, gestures or of, um, of standing, of sitting, of uh, doing a movement, of um, doing tea or something like this. this. There are a lot of movements, but I think they have in common that the kata are very reduced. Um, you have a very um, complex a set of movements, but you try to find something like the ideal movement or something like that. So, kata are in a way um, performative generalities, something like concepts in intellectual reasoning, which are also um, could also be thought of as um, reduced and very um, um, uh, very representative um, elements in thought. So. You have this, this kind of, uh, you could call it an embodied logic, and there you try to find um, uh, points of reference 
And these, uh, for me, are in, in, the, Japan, in, the, um, in the Japanese embodiment arts, um, the kata. So you find um, a kind of approach where uh, this, these um, uh, practices or the representatives of these practices try to find a way to uh, system systematize their own practice. They uh, try to not only practice it um, in, a, in, a, uh, in any which way, but they try to find something which is um, at the center of this practice. This makes it possible to, um, uh, to see this practice, um, to, to have objective references in this practice. So if you just practice and you don't define uh, elements uh, of this practice, like kata, you don't have a point of reference because practice in itself is only referring to itself. If you just practice, there's only self-reference to the actual moment. You don't have anything to say, um, this is the content of the practice. So this is also something that separates practice from poiesis, right? In poiesis, you have uh, something you create and it's um, separated from the producer. But in practice, you normally have, don't have these kind of artifacts. So I think we can think of kata as a, as a special kind of artifact. Uh, I called it here performative uh, artifact. So these artifacts, they are something objectified, but at the same time different than in other kinds of poiesis, you cannot um, separate these performative act artifacts totally from the, from, the, from the practice itself. If there, like Enrico said, if there is no practitioner, practitioner um, practicing these forms, they don't exist. If you lose somebody who has these forms in his body, in his bodily memory, they, um, they are gone. Unlike, for example, um, I heard the presentation by Philip, and uh, you talked about the way of, uh, like, um, uh, how to do a philosophy of um, photography, and that, um, yeah, that photos are, for example, for, for some of these theories, a point of reference. And uh, so, if if the photographer dies, there are still his photos. You can look at the photos. But this this is not the case in the, in, the, in uh, for Qatar. So what I'm trying to do now is to give a short reference to um, the phenomenology of Merleau-Ponty and his interpretation of the re, uh, phenomenolo phenomenological reduction and try to see how we could connect this uh, kind of reduction that's found in Qatar to uh, the phenomenological reduction. In his uh, Phenomenology of Perception, uh, Merleau-Ponty um, says some uh, words about Husserl's um, way of um, always reinterpreting um, the phenomenological reduction and the epoche. And he says that the most important, uh, this quote, the most important lesson which, we, with the, which the reduction teaches us is the impossibility of a complete reduction. So in the epoche or in the reduction, we are trying to get some kind of distance from everyday life. We kind of try to find a sphere of ideality from which we can analyze everyday life or, um, or conscious life. Um, if we are absorbed in this uh, conscious everyday life, we, we don't have the uh, ability to get a, a look at it and uh, analyze it. So we have to find some way to to um, do a reduction or a distancing from this uh, kind of everyday absorbed activity to, um, to create a science about this um, experience. But we can never do it completely because we are living beings. So if we did a complete reduction, we would be dead or something like that. We, we wouldn't be the living beings we are. We are always absorbed in what we are doing. And even if we analyze what we are doing, we are absorbed in analyzing. Now comes a, a little bit longer quote, um, which I just want to read uh, out. So here's a quote. Every reduction, says Husserl, as well as being transcendental, is necessarily eidetic. That means that we cannot subject our perception to, of the world to philosophical scrutiny without ceasing to be identified with that act of positing the world. With that interest, in which, 
with that interest in it which delimits us, without drawing back from our commitment, which is itself thus made to appear as a spectacle, without passing from the fact of our existence to its nature, from the Dasein to the Wesen. So the Dasein is kind of the absorbed uh, coping uh, in my phrasing and the, the Wesen is kind of a reduction to an I ideal sphere where we can reduce the complexity of everyday life so that we can an analyze it. But it is clear that the essence is here not the end, but a means, that our reflective involvement in the world is precisely what has to be understood and made amenable for, to conceptualization. For it is what polarizes all our conceptual particular, particularizations. The need to proceed by way of essences does not mean that philosophy takes them as its object, but, on the contrary, that our existence is too tightly held in the world to be able to know itself as such at the moment of its involvement, and that it requires the field of ideality in order to become acquainted with and to prevail over its facticity. So we see here that Merleau-Ponty says we need ideality, we need essences, we need a reduction from uh, everyday life. But this uh, reduction is not an end in, in, in itself, but um, just a means to get back to everyday life. To understand exactly this everyday life we have been distancing ourselves from. In a similar way, I'm trying uh, in my uh, thesis to understand kata as a kind of phenopractical reduction. So a reduction that is done not in the field of intellectual reasoning, but in the practice of um, bodily enactment itself. So if we have a kata, um, we are doing a kind of reduction. We are reducing complexity of a, of a movement or of some action in everyday life, like um, doing tea. But this um, reduction of uh, the movement or of the, of the action is not an end in itself. We try to transform our everyday life. And I think that's kind of the, uh, if there is a philosophical meaning to these uh, ways of self-cultivation, it is to return to everyday life, to transform our everyday life. To do this, we have to do a distancing to get uh, this everyday life um, to, to be able to analyze it. But in the end, we try to return to everyday life and, um, and transform our way of, of perceiving the world or of being uh, embodied in the world. Um, in, this, um, uh, in connection to this, I'm trying to do a, a distinction between kata and katachi. So kata um, is this kind of reduced form, an uh, ideal form. And katachi, um, I, I want to refer to, um, um, to a definition in, uh, in, an, uh, in the Kogo Daijiten, uh, a Japanese uh, lexicon on um, old terms. And uh, I found this, um, this comment on katachi, which I found very interesting. In the case of katachi, chi is a suffix, also found in words uh, such as kokochi, mood, Chi possibly has the same origin as in the expressions ikazuchi, thunder, or hayachi, strong wind. The original meaning of katachi denotes more than just the mere outer form or figure, and all mentioned expressions have in common that they conceive an appearing form as the manifestation of something spiritual which is found in the inner sphere of the human being. So the difference, according to this comment, is that the chi in katachi is uh, denoting something connected to life or something spiritual that is not found in the kata. And I would say that this is pretty similar to the, um, uh, to the difference of uh, leib and körper, so um, the objective body and the lived body in uh, phenomenology. So the, the körper is maybe close to what uh, kata is in this distinction. It's a, an objectified form. It's uh, something we can analyze, like the kata which has been reduced from, from the everyday um, life experience. And katachi is something that's endowed with life. It's something like the life, a lived body. It's a lived form. <coughs> 
so I think um, that we have to think about this, um, uh, this kind of movement between ideality and uh, lived experience also uh, in connection to the embodiment arts and to embodied practice and also in connection to a possible science of this embodied practice. I just uh, want to give a short comment on um, my understanding of key in this context. So I think that key, um, which could also be closely connected to the chi at the end of katachi, um, the thing, uh, this element that makes the um, the objectified kata a lived um, form, is for me um, a, like a reference to. Um, the content of proprioception and interoception and kinesthesis. So um, I don't know if uh, everybody here has uh, ever heard about proprioception or interoception, but um, just as a comment, it's um, like it's often um, contrasted to outer perception. Um, interoception is, for example, the the um, perception of the what's going on in the in, on the inside of the body. So sensing um, like. Um, how the, the kind of um, force you put into your muscles and stuff like that is, uh, is distributed in the body and stuff like this. And um, kinesthesis is the perception of movements. And I think that these elements play, uh, play a very crucial role if we go from kata to katachi. So um, this kinesthesis and proprioception are normally forms of perception which are very, we are um, normally unaware of. Um, also in phenomenology, normally uh, in classical phenomenology, there was a, um, uh, a focus on outer perception, um, although the, the later Husserl also in included this kind of sense of movement. I can't go into detail uh, into this now, um, I just wanted to mention it um, so, uh, so that uh, we can have a clue and how to connect uh, this, this very obscure term key to a um, possible um, method in phenomenology. And uh, for now, I want to come to an end with this um, presentation. And um, I'm happy if you have comments or questions. So thank you very much for your attention. for this question. Um, I think it's uh, very interesting. Um, I think the door in the different uh, self, uh, arts of self-cultivation, it's, it's not something that's always, um, it has a philosophical sounding, but it's not always, uh, if you go into the concrete practice, often they don't see it as a philosophical practice. It's just a technical kind of thing they are doing. I think it's not something factual, but something like a, something where they want to go to, something the founders of the of the doors uh, had in mind when they created this, these arts, that it's kind of um, a future promise. So if you go in the concrete practice, you're often uh, like, you don't see what you want to see there as a philosopher. And the, the jutsu, um, uh, this, I think they have a very strong um, focus on the technical side, which is always included, I think, in kata. But um, there's also a passage in the Zhuangzi, um, a Chinese philosopher, where he says that the, the way 
uh, doesn't is, is not just mere technique. There's something more in the way than the technique. You have to do the technique. You have to go to the extreme of the technique. And then you get to something, um, something else, something that um, transcends this, this kind of technical aspect of the, of the art. And he gives the, the example of the oxen and the, the cook who um, carves through the joints of the oxen with, without thinking about it. He, he has embodied this practice so much that for him, he, um, it, his life is so much connected to this practice that um, it, it kind of imbues his, his everyday life. And that's what I said about um, everyday life. For me, the everyday life is the actual place of embodiment. That's the kind of... That's where we, where, um, we should aim at, uh, according to my uh, conception. So, the true place of philosophy and also of embodiment is everyday life. But we are doing philosophy as an academic uh, discipline, for example, and often uh, we are, um, maybe we, we, uh, we don't like how, how it's going, but still we need this academic um, profession. But then we have to go back and always see how is it connected to our, to our everyday life? How is it connected to how um, I, 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 um, I live in this world? And I think um, the, the embodiment arts should also aim at something like that. Um, additionally to trying to find the elementary. So kata is for me uh, something to find, like the, the striving to find the elementary. Something similar to finding uh, basic categories in philosophy, for example. Um, okay. yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, to the first question, um, not seeing form only uh, kata or katachi as the form of the individual body, but for example of cities or of wider spatial arrangements, maybe also of um, not only of um, spatial arrangements, but of arrangements of time. I think that's very interesting and uh, of course I, I would say this is also part of thinking about katachi and kata and form. Um, in this uh, part I just um, uh, focused on the, on the um, practice of bodies alike. But I, I wouldn't say that um, this should be excluded from thinking about uh, katachi. It's just because I, I can't talk about anything or everything at the same time. So. But it's very interesting to think also about the spatial form of cities, for example. I find this very, very interesting topic. Um, yeah, the aim of, my, of what I'm doing, I'm uh, not uh, always sure myself, so uh, I don't know if I can answer to this properly. Um, I, I wanted, what I'm interested in that is that um, from an East Asian perspective, philo philosophy is always kind of traditionally connected to self-cultivation or to, to practicing something with the body. Not just thinking, like if you think about Dogen, it has so much to do with practicing something uh, in the medium of the body. And I think this is a great chance for philosophy to find something that uh, was lost uh, 
uh, in the history of philosophy, because if you think about uh, the philosophy of antiquity, there were um, the Stoics or the uh, Epicureans uh, with, who, who had this kind of uh, idea of ascesis and philosophy as ascesis as a practice that goes into your everyday life. Like They had very different methods. They had these meditations where you think about death or about what you did uh, in this day. And uh, the, so the aspect of embodiment is not as much um, focused in, in their practice. And I think uh, it's, it's a big chance for philosophy to look at these embodiment practices, which are also a kind of ascesis, but which have a, a different focus. And I think this can enrich um, philosophy very much. And my approach is phenomenology because I want to include first-person perspective into philosophy. And I think that's very important to do this. So this is why I'm coming from phenomenology and try to do this from, from this perspective. Also because the embodied subject, uh, I think the first-person perspective is very um, important for this practice. Yeah, first to the etymology. I think um, for me, it's not. I'm not so much interested in etymology. So if it's not like this, uh, it's okay for me. I just use the term uh, in this sense to to make a difference in the practice itself, which I think is there. So I need some word to do this. So, um, but I I I, um, I think that the um, the etymology etymology I had here is kind of um, might be correct because. Also, if you look into Shinto um, terminology, there are often uh, references to something like uh, katashiro, which is a, um, a katachi or a form, which uh, in the shiro is kind of a representative, the, the meaning uh, to rep represent something. And uh, these katashiro are objects which uh, give the opportunity for kami, for, um, for uh, Japanese gods, to go inside this um, katachi and um, give it life. So, the katashiro is kind of a receptacle for, um, for life or for kami. So I think there is some connection uh, also in, in this kind of traditional Shinto thought, for example, which give us clues that this might be a, um, a valuable uh, etymology. And the other question was about uh, kata katachi, um, uh, how is it, it is used in, uh, in martial arts. I didn't get the question, I think. Yes, if you find what would be the difference in meaning mm. Yeah, they uh, they don't do it, so I'm I'm doing it. The difference. So normally they they are just talking about kata or waza, or they they don't. Uh, there are people who do it, but normally they just practice. So this is this is what what's coming from the direction of philosophy, which could be uh, valuable for these practices, to to think about what's going on there and uh, find a reflective standpoint to to transform these arts maybe in a new direction. So yeah. <coughs> 
said that, uh, well, if it doesn't pass over into everyday life, they don't go back to everyday life with what they've learned or with any message at all, then it's kind of incomplete. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. My problem is that this passing back to everyday life, it looks to be something outside of the mind. Mm -hmm. That's something you either do or you don't do. You may be a really good team master, but you're a terrible husband. But um, in Minamoto's second book, the Kata Tanimoto, I think in the opening chapter, he talks about this in a very interesting way. He says that he calls it the, the omotenashi, that what you do before the tea ceremony and what you do after the tea ceremony, the way you receive the guests, you bring them into the house, you make them relax, and the way you send them off again, that's part of the Kata. Without that, you don't have the Kata. So my question is, if you're going to do a full amount of phenomenology, maybe you have to look at um, some hidden aspects. For example, in Zayami, mm -hmm. um, how he sent his students off <coughs> with the yoi of the performance, or how he sent the audience off, perhaps. Or in the case of, um, of Kendo or this Aido, for example, is there anything before and after mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. actually a formalized way of saying it mm -hmm. belongs to everyday life? Yeah. Or is it just the content is separate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for this very uh, interesting question. Um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the way of tea because I think this is very closely connected to everyday life. It's about making tea, which is kind of a everyday life practice. So this is also why I chose the picture of uh, Chado as a background there. But I think um, maybe in the text of Zeami we don't find how he uh, how he did the preparation for the performances maybe we have like uh, structuring the whole day but um, in the case of the martial arts for example we, we talked about how a day is something uh, like uh, etiquette or like um, being uh, polite or showing respect to the to the dojo to other people um, and how you interact with other practitioners for example uh, this uh, regi aspect of the practice is very important. So maybe this is something similar to what you uh, talked about for Chado and as, as the preparation before and after. It's, um, it's connected to this kind of social practice uh, which is also performed in I totally agree with you, so I think uh, it's also important to look at this surrounding uh I think there's also a discussion at the at the end. Um, uh, if, uh, after e all the um, presentations have finished, we will have a concluding discussion. Maybe if we don't have time now, I don't know. <laughs>